Welcome back to Russia Christie Community Unite and buckle up because you are in for one heck of a ride tonight. I will be red pilling you this evening, if you know that reference from the Matrix, which means you'll be receiving more information than you could possibly process in about an hour. It is important that you know this up front and that this is the game plan. I want you to relax. <laughs> And just listen, the vast majority of the slides I'm going to put up are there not so that you feel the actual need to digest them, but rather just so that you know that this material exists and is available to you should you want to dive deeper. Tonight has also been designed to serve all the folks who reached out to us asking for this content specifically because they're dealing with it themselves and need help. So we're serving several specific populations with this content tonight, both here in-house as well as online if you're new here, or if this is your first night with us, welcome. This is a place where we study apologetics together as a family in order to deepen our understanding of Christianity, how to articulate ourselves accurately about our faith, and keep up with changing culture around us such that we might respond with truth and love. Running, of course, the great race that has been set before us as we move through the sanctification process together. It is here where we train and equip ourselves with the tools we need to rage against the enemy and hold the line while our King Jesus advances the kingdom and advance the kingdom he is doing. It is also a place where folks who are critical of Christianity can come and observe us in our element, ask questions, and get answers. You'll have noticed that we took a bit of a hiatus this past semester. This is because we needed to take the time to work with everyone who requested help theologically on a personal basis. These are all the folks who haven't felt comfortable coming up to the mic and instead talk to us afterwards or contact us through the YouTube channel. I am thrilled to report that the vast majority of attendees to these nights who have requested help over the years that we have been doing this have not been Christians, which means that opening up the study of apologetics to the public here in our area has been exceptionally fruitful. Not only have we seen some of our most vocal community atheists soften towards us, but I can also say with certainty that of the ones who have invited the conversation, all have been outfitted with English Bibles containing full translation notes so that they can continue to study what the scriptures actually say, as opposed to what they only thought they said or however sarcastically they could pull King James Version verses out of context. This atheist apologist phenomenon even caught the attention of the local newspaper, and on Monday they featured our work on the front page. Did you see that? The point being is that an impact is being made, and the impact is because of all of you. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for striving with us and alongside us and training up the community in apologetics, and thank you for your patience with us while we do that work. If you want to learn more about this process, how it works, or if you're interested in sponsoring this particular arm of apologetics ministry, please see me after um, when we get finished tonight, and we'll talk more about putting these very specific Bibles into the hands of our neighbors who need them. That being said, during the hiatus, something very big indeed, did indeed occur. For those of you that do not already know, the world of apologetics has different subcategories and specialties. For example, when you ask me a question I cannot answer, I normally refer you to one of my colleagues who is another apologist who does specialize in that particular subject matter. As you may or may not already be aware, my specialty is cults and new religions, or more broadly, the intersection of psychology and theology which is why I sometimes disappear around here to go do an assessment or to speak on how indoctrination occurs or even exit counsel folks who have come out of these highly controlling and spiritually damaging environments. So when an alert came across my desk that 130 acres had just been purchased to build a compound and divinity school by one of the gurus we are tracking, I jumped a bit faster than I normally would since that 130 acre compound was purchased in Granger County. We'll get to those details in a minute. The point being, I have been pushing off a night entirely devoted to cult theology because I thought I was being biased trying to force material I personally find enthralling, but something you all might not need. But that's no longer the case. This stuff is here, it's serious, and it will shortly be a characteristic feature of our community. 
and I need as many trained Christians as I can get to be doing the legwork to warn others and help get people out of these places. So tonight, pay close attention and ask lots of questions because whether you are personally interested in this material or not is completely irrelevant now. This material will be coming to our backyards, whether we wish it to or not, shortly. And we're going to be doing this study, exercising and employing that framework I showed you last semester, so that instead of simply referencing it, you will understand how it works in real time, so that you can do this yourselves in your own homes. It's my job to make it so that you no longer need me. So tonight we are going to watch an apologist break down a book of the Bible dealing with the pertinent content matter in real time. We can't know what to do with cult groups or how to respond to them unless we first know our guidelines and what the Lord has to say on the subject in order to orient and order our thoughts as we proceed. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Titus, and that way you'll be ready when we get there. Remember our hermeneutic circle from previous nights? I'm putting it back up here so that it gets burnt into your psyche. This process is pertinent to tonight's study because this is how you keep your Bible teachers, preachers, evangelists, apologists, anyone willing to speak authoritatively about what the Bible has to say, accountable. This process is here so that you can know that your authorities are not lying or misleading you. This process is here to assess the quality of your teacher's personal standards for educating the people of God. This process is here to protect you from me. I am a sinner just like every other Bible teacher, and I could easily get caught up in my own ego and desire for grandeur or pursuit of attention or whatever happens to ail me at any given moment. There is no sin that I am somehow immune to. You name it, and it's possible for me. If you do not have a way to test to see if I'm failing or manipulating, then you will not be able to hold me to the biblical standards of what is expected of someone claiming to be called by the Lord to do this type of work. It is not enough for me to say the words, I feel called to teach. We must happen, uh, what must happen if that calling is real, regardless of how I feel about it is that my claim to be called will be confirmed by both my wielding of the scriptures in an accurate way, as well as existing Christian teachers recognizing the call, confirming it, and then testing it constantly for the life of the teacher in order to verify it is actually the Lord doing the calling. Why do we do this? Is it some arbitrary decision made by some fancy religious people somewhere? No, it's right here in the Bible that we are to test all things, that's 1 Thessalonians, as well as all of the markers of a teacher of the Bible, which are primarily found in the pastoral epistles. That's 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. But not only there, we have scores of material for how to identify false teachers as well. The Lord has given us a framework by which we are to identify those he has called. He has also given us a framework to identify people who are not called by him, but are claiming they are due to ignorance or self-centered gain. And since tonight's topic is focusing on just such occurrences, it behooves us to get our bearings first by way of examining what the Lord has to say in this regard. So that's what we're going to do. If you are new and you haven't seen this before, this is called the hermeneutic circle. Hermeneutics is the process of interpretation. Interpretation is not a free-for-all. Interpreting the Bible is not about how a verse makes you feel or what we would like to be true about the scriptures. Interpretation is the process of removing ourselves and our biases from the text to the greatest degree possible such that the Holy Spirit can disclose himself to us so that we can respond and so that our response can be tested objectively and in union with everyone else who is hearing from the Holy Spirit through the scriptures as well. Reading out of the Bible, what it says in order to respond appropriately, is called exegesis, and that is what we want to do as Bible students. We want to exegete. And so we begin by turning to the section of the scriptures that applies to our question of the evening with the greatest obviousness. The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So my childhood pastor used to say. The pastoral epistles are literally letters, that's what the word epistle means, from Paul to two new pastors who themselves are dealing with false teachers in their midst, posing as gurus, hearing from God. 
And so we get this cult response material from the apostles preserved through time in the miraculous form this preservation takes, the New Testament, and in particular, the book of Titus. Looking at our hermeneutic circle, we begin with step one. What are the historical, grammatical, contextual, and literary details that we need in order to glean from the text both Paul's intention in writing to Titus, but also how Titus would have received this information? Notice that step one has nothing to do whatsoever with what we think. We are simply immersing ourselves in Titus's world at the time that he was receiving this letter, and we are silent observers. So let's observe together. Well, first and foremost, you'll notice that Titus is rather short in length for the otherwise verbose Apostle Paul. And this is for a very good reason. Normally, Paul utilized the help of an amanuensis, the ancient equivalent to a secretary, to do the work of transcribing what Paul was saying verbally. Tertius of Iconium, the jolly fellow who says hello at the end of the book of Romans, was one of Paul's amanuenses, for example. That, of course, did not stop Paul from writing bits on the original letters in his own penmanship. The greeting at the very end of 1 Corinthians, as well as Galatians, features Paul's self-consciousness over his need to write in large print. Most scholars agree that the thorn in the flesh that Paul speaks of not being healed from and at keeping him humble was a continued loss of eyesight as he aged, a polite reminder to the apostle that the blindness he was initially struck by and cured from at the point he converted to Christianity is authored entirely by the sovereign will of his creator and our King Jesus, and that his current failing eyesight was a reminder that his time on earth as an apostle was limited and he needed to keep that in mind as he worked. And unfortunately for Paul, the normal and rather luxurious accommodations he once had as a Roman citizen for those other letters, he no longer enjoys. At the point of writing to Timothy and Titus, by the time of the penning of the pastoral epistles, Paul is here, the Mamertine prison in Rome. It was dark, dank, and cramped. Whatever writing he could get complete was contingent upon how much sunlight could get through that hole on any given day. And what was worse was that Paul knew that his death was imminent, and therefore these final instructions to the men he left behind in Ephesus and Crete were indeed possibly final instructions. The grammar is rushed. It's saturated in nuanced details that Titus and Timothy would have understood was specific to their plights with the local cults they were plagued by and wrought with wonderfully profound local insights from the man who had himself been there and begun Christian congregations in their midst. And for Titus, this meant having been left behind alone in the Greco-Roman equivalent of a cultural cesspit. So famous for outrageous levels of violent crime, swindling, cheating, and lying was this island that an entire word had to be invented to describe the sheer untrustworthiness and debased nature of the island's inhabitants, the word Cretan. Because in Greek, they didn't have anything else that could embody such a dismal phenomenon in a single word. Of the ancient Greek world, Crete was possibly the most ancient even of that, the very first civilization in Europe headquartered there, the Minoans, known most famously for the story of their great and legendary warrior, the Minotaur. So ferocious was this giant hybrid human that he had to have a specific holding cell designed for him. And legend says that this being's name was Asterius, which literally means starry and is also a common reference in the ancient world for a race of giants who had been authored by beings who had come from the heavens. But so ancient was this group that by the time we get to the first century, some 3,500 years later, even the very inhabitants of Crete were at a loss for what precisely to do with the high places dedicated to the predominantly female pantheon of gods that were worshipped by the Minoans, but whose details were largely lost now that their temples had been left derelict on the island. This female-worshipping civilization, you see, had begun crumbling around the 15th century B.C., and it fully come to an end in the 12th century BC. And the people in that time period, seeing the end was nearing for their culture, had sailed to the next closest civilization, Egypt, and settled there, adopting the Egyptian name for their origin on Crete, Palusada, 
And then from there, Ramses III relocated them away from the Nile and into Canaan, where they are documented in Hebrew and Greek as the Philistines. That's right. You know the group of folks that are encountered over and over and over again from the Exodus generation all the way down to the story of David and Goliath and beyond? Those are the very folks we're referencing here. And what's interesting is that up until just a few years ago, the Old Testament was the only really emphatic reference point for the fact that the Philistines came specifically from the island of Crete. Fourteen times the authors of the Old Testament remind readers of this point specifically, going so far as to isolate the island from the rest of Europe as this group's point of origin. And in 2019, there was no real way, or and until 2019, there was no real way to test whether or not this documentation was true. That is, until a group of archaeologists agreed to subject some of the bodies they had uncovered from the city of Ashkelon, which is one of five Philistine fortress cities, where, sure enough, the genetic markers came back of European origin, as opposed to Levantine. Turns out that once again, whoever was writing the scriptures at that point in history really knew what they were saying and documented actual history accurately and in a way that would have been otherwise lost to us over the centuries had we relied on only sources outside of the Bible. And Titus, having been trained by the Apostle Paul, an expert in the Old Testament in his own right, would have understood all of this. But what may have been new to Titus would be how first century Cretans treated their mixed religious heritage. On top of having leftover Minoan goddesses, they also had a cult of personality devoted to a false prophet named Epimenides. And by that point in history, Epimenides had garnered for himself quite a reputation as a semi-mythical seer and philosopher whose own skin carried the heritage of ancient European shamanic religions. Mixing all of this material together, Epimenides had authored a distinct religion called Orphism, where everything from reincarnation to asceticism to the worship of Zeus was taught. But by Titus's time, the thing that Epimenides was most venerated for was what is called the Epimenides Paradox, um, which is summarized in the following statement. Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies which is paradoxical in the sense that Epimenides was a Cretan. So doesn't that make him a prophet who is a liar, an evil beast, and an idle belly? And of course, as this was the undercurrent worldview of the island, relational communication was at an all-time low. Rebellion and defiance was the name of the game from interpersonal relationships to familial. Even to the point of business transactions, at this point in history, citizens of the empire had the right to pay off debts by contracting themselves to a household for work, such that the household then agreed to pay off the debt on your behalf in return for serving the household and receiving free room and board. This was called bond slavery and was commonplace. Laws protecting this process as well as protecting the households who took on the burden of paying off large amounts of debt were apparently being ignored on the island along with the litany of other laws also famously ignored here. So, with that as our introductory information, let's turn to Titus and read the letter together. Since it is a letter, it's appropriate to read the entire thing in one sitting, just like you would any other letter, to get a feel for how Paul wanted his thoughts to be received. Paragraph breaks and chapter headings do not exist in the manuscripts we make English translations from, and sometimes those artificial breaks that are placed in there by your translators to help organize the text can throw off our natural reception of the information. So I'm going to skip over those since this letter was written as one cohesive set of thoughts. I am reading from a New English translation with full translation notes. This is for all my atheists in the crowd tonight. This is the, your Bible. If you don't have one of these and you are a leader in your household overseeing your family's studies, it is my highest recommendation that you get one. It makes this process infinitely more streamlined. All right, here we go. Paul's letter to Titus as he rushes to get down everything he can think of that Titus may need to organize the church in a ramshackle and anciently deviant island of Crete. From Paul, a slave of God and apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's chosen ones and the knowledge of the truth that is in keeping with godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before time began. 
but now in his own time he has made his message evident through the preaching I was entrusted with according to the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my genuine son in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was to set in order the remaining matters and to appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children, who cannot be charged with dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be blameless as one entrusted with God's work, not arrogant, not prone to anger, not a drunkard, not violent, not greedy for gain. Instead, he must be hospitable, devoted to what is good, sensible, upright, devout, and self-controlled. He must hold firmly to the faithful message as it has been taught, so that he will be able to give exhortation in such healthy teaching and correct those who speak against it. For there are many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those with Jewish connections who must be silenced because they mislead whole families by teaching for dishonest gain what ought not to be taught. A certain one of them, in fact, one of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And such testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply that they may be healthy in the faith and not pay attention to Jewish myths and commands of people who reject the truth. All is pure to those who are pure. But to those who are corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They profess to know God, but with their deeds they deny him, since they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good deed. But as for you, communicate the behavior that goes with sound teaching. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Older women, likewise, are to exhibit behavior fitting of those who are holy, not slandering, not slaves to excessive drinking, but teaching what's good. In this way, they will train the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, fulfilling their duties at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the message of God may not be discredited. Encourage younger men, likewise, to be self-controlled, showing yourself to be an example of good works in every way. In your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and a sound message that cannot be criticized, so that any opponent will be at a loss, because he has nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be subject to their own masters in everything, to do what is wanted and not talk back, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, and in order to bring credit to the teaching of God our Savior in everything. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It trains us to reject godless ways and worldly desires and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age as we wait for the happy fulfillment of our hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to set us free from every kind of lawlessness and to purify for himself a people who are truly his, who are eager to do good. So communicate these things with the sort of exhortation or rebuke that carries full authority. Don't let anyone look down on you. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. They must not slander anyone, but be peaceable, gentle, showing complete courtesy to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, misled, enslaved to various passions and desires, spending our lives in evil and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of his mercy, through the washing of the new birth and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us in full measure through Jesus Christ our Savior. And so, since we have been justified by his grace, we become heirs with the confident expectation of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on such truths so that those who have placed their faith in God may be intent on engaging in good works. These things are good and beneficial for all people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, quarrels, and fights about the law, because they're useless and empty. Reject a divisive person after one or two warnings. You know that such a person is twisted by sin and is conscious of it himself. When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Make every effort to help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. Make sure they have what they need. Here's another way that our people can learn to engage in good works to meet pressing needs and so not to be unfruitful. Everyone with me greets you. Greet those, with, greet those who love us in the faith and grace be with you all. So, we have a letter devoted almost entirely to giving a new young pastor with a new parish guidance on how to identify the people he needs to put in leadership positions within the church. 
We also have the expectation that people who are in leadership positions within the church should have conduct that is consistent with sound teaching, which means that we have the expectation of really knowing what the difference between sound and unsound teaching actually looks like. Elders and overseers in the church are to be firmly and truly committed to the scriptures, and they are expected to be competent in them enough to refute those who stand opposed to sound doctrine which means that a leadership position in the church comes with the expectation that a leader's conduct is expected to be negative when appropriate. That they're not the sort of person who gets lost in their own niceness or the surrounding culture's expectation of behavior. They are to behave in a way that is peaceable, gentle, and kind, but they are to do so without losing their spines because kindness is not spinelessness. As the waves of changing philosophies and generations come and go, they are to be the sort of people who stand firmly on the timeless doctrines we have received and are not blown here and there by the temptation of using their peaceable, gentle, and kind dispositions to be people pleasers to the neglect of the truth. Bold, but not arrogant. Gentle, but not yielding. Kind, but not spineless. See the distinction? The next phase of the hermeneutic circle is to compare the synopsis we just made with alternative areas of scripture dealing with the same subject matter to make certain we're accurately reflecting God's perspective on this subject. If God is consistent, and he is, then we should expect to see these notions repeated elsewhere, and at the very least, we want to make certain that the unity of God's word is maintained throughout. There are no formal contradictions in the Bible. Therefore, if our synopsis contradicts something elsewhere in the Bible, then our synopsis is incorrect and we need to go back. We want to make as many verses, or we want to take as many verses as we can from as many different authors and timelines as possible so that our cross references span the largest chunks of the Bible as possible. Other locations where teaching and eldership expectations are discussed includes, of course, First and Second Timothy, Romans, and Second Corinthians. And as we should expect, since those were all authored by Paul, it makes sense that he's consistent across the board on that one. And interestingly, he is even more emphatic with what was occurring in Corinth in that he advises the leadership that when one engages false teachers there, the expected conduct should include a sharp rebuke something that in this day and age would be seen as unexpectedly aggressive. Meaning that correction in the context of keeping the theology sound inside of a church is not antithetical to being kind, gentle, and respectful. It is instead one of the necessary vehicles for upholding kindness, gentleness, and respect. It is the greatest kindness to show the individuals under your care and oversight that you respect them enough to tell them the truth and encourage their flourishing with theological correction. And King Solomon reminds us of this clearly in his 27th proverb, that wounds inflicted by a friend can be trusted because our friends want what's best for us and oftentimes we behave and move in ways that are not best for us. So that when our friends correct us and the pain of a disciplinary word occurs, that pain is inflicted for a good and wonderful reason to point us back toward the path that leads to our flourishing. The prophet Isaiah goes even a step further to call attention to the psychological phenomenon of the people of God getting used to hearing false teachers on a regular basis and then being introduced to an accurate teacher. The reaction, he says, will be an aversion to what they are hearing to such a high degree that they will ask for the false teachers back even though they know already that they're false. Let us hear no more, they will say. Tell us only smooth things, they will say. Even Peter, the apostle who himself was called out in Acts for caving to false teachings out of a cowardly failure to speak up when he knew what was happening was wrong, gives us warnings about false teachers in his second letter that is consistent with our synopsis. So in looking at Titus, it appears that yes, our analysis with the rest of the Bible is spot on by way of detail and a significant enough focus that God has made this an anchor point through the vast majority of humanity's time here on earth. We're going to encounter false teachers. This is due to several reasons. Elders and overseers are going to be raised up in the local church to be a check for these reasons. We need to test their authority constantly to make certain they are not liars themselves and taking advantage of this framework. 
That test comes down to their conduct being found in accordance with sound doctrine, which means they will take their role very seriously both in front of the eyes of their parish as well as in the privacy of their own homes. We should expect that this as that as this occurs, the people who are frauds will be made apparent, and as this process continues, there will be recurring phenomenon that we all will have to battle within ourselves and our households, and that is that if we habitually sit under the teachings of people who God has not called to these positions, that we will begin preferring the false teaching to the true, and it will be increasingly more difficult to identify that we are surrendering our flourishing to the ones who give us itching ears, give our itching ears what they would like to hear as opposed to what they need to hear. And it can all be summarized in the Lord's words themselves. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it that way. But what will you do in the end? What will you do in the end? What are we doing right now? This is the contextualization of the timeless principles taught by God to the entirety of the human race for all time. This is where we take what we have established as step two and we apply it to ourselves, specifically in the modern context, as we enter step three of the hermeneutic circle, the painful part. From where and from whom are we receiving our theological education? What influences are we habitually sitting under and how are those influences having an effect on our flourishing? Are there false teachers in our midst? Are our church authorities consistent or are they hypocrites? Are our spiritual authorities doing the right thing and drawing distinctions that may be wounding for the protection of their flocks and in accordance with sound doctrine? Are they teaching their flocks to be able to do this themselves? Do they have a spine when it comes to false teachers in their community? These are the questions that each of us must apply to our local churches, ourselves, and what we're subjecting our families to, moms and dads. Remember that Paul warns Titus that the power of the false teachers is that they excel in taking entire families into their wake. You are also spiritual authorities over your children. These expectations apply to you as well. But for tonight's purposes, we're going to subject the person with the audacity to wear a microphone and claim that she has the authority to give you talks like this to the test. We're going to test my spine as an example. The rest is up to you. We live in a land with a great deal of false teachers posing as authentic ones. When we issue rebukes of high control groups like I'm about to outline, we focus on the leadership, not the followers. This is for a very important reason, as I will explain here shortly. The brunt of it, though, is that we focus our rebuke on those who are actively deceiving. We do not focus on those who have been deceived by these deceivers. For although they too are wrong, in the cases I'm about to bring up, the deceived are also victims of coercion and abuse at the hands of their oversight. Followers of these groups here in our community should be given extra care and concern and sensitivity due to the level of spiritual abuse they are receiving or have received at the hands of these people. Make certain not to mistake the good and helpful rebuke of false teachers that I'm about to give for the unhelpful and unhealthy rebuke of their students. We call out false teachers. We call into fellowship their students so that they might taste and see that the Lord is good in contrast to what they are experiencing at the hands of their abusers whose score the Lord will settle himself when they go to meet him. Got it? Okay. All right. Commencing the rebuke right now. Brace yourselves. We will begin this kind and gentle rebuke session with one of the obvious examples in our specific community the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They take the scriptures and they willfully twist them into whatever will suit their purposes in the moment. Not only have they knowingly altered the Old and New Testament so that their followers cannot know that they are being misled, but they also willfully subject their adherents to the lie that in their session they are hearing directly from God on the formulation of doctrines, production of written material for publication, and on the administration of global operations for this group. And I'm not talking hearing from God in a reading your Bible and praying sense. I'm saying that they claim that they are the only people who are actively and continually hearing from God on specific content that only they can hear. 
and no one else, so there's no way to test the claim. Control of the group falls to only these eight guys currently, but has been as high as 18 members in previous decades. Both the current governing body members, as well as the members of the governing body in the past, have engaged in an active and premeditated lie in order to maintain power over their adherents and continue to solicit their fraudulently gained tithes. They also willfully teach their higher-ups to lie on their behalf, they neither know Christ nor do they teach him. These men are blind guides of the blind, but in their case, it is a willful blindness since they actively and regularly seek to hide their failures. Instead, they control their adherents by making unavailable to them and the general public older publications that would out their failed prophecies about the end of the world and Armageddon. They also remove access to older material and remove reference points for checking resources. These men are so out to lunch on full reversal of doctrines that they claim are being given directly from God that they had to invent a new phrase to explain what was happening. They teach their adherents to say to themselves that their failed prophecies and incoherent Christobabble is as a result of the light getting brighter. Meaning, no guys, we totally hear directly from God, and he is clear, except sometimes when he's not and we are mistaken, and in those cases, it's because he wasn't clear, but we thought he was, so just ignore this and move on, there's nothing to see here. This has happened so often and in such a great number that we literally have to index all of their failures just to keep it documented. The core doctrines of this group are as follows, that Jesus is not divine, nor is he the second person of the Trinity. The Trinity is denied in its entirety, including the Holy Spirit, who is not a person or has power, but is instead what they call an active force, what the Father employs to do his work. Think of the Holy Spirit as radar, for example. Not alive, just a physical force. Jesus, in reality, they teach once you've made it into the group far enough, is actually Michael the Archangel who came to earth invisibly in 1914 to enact his millennial reign and who did not physically resurrect. The resurrection is a lie. Jesus' body actually just disintegrated in the tomb, which was why it was found empty, and later the Father gave him a spirit body. If you maintain an active membership as a Jehovah's Witness, being intentionally consistent in all of the faithful and discreet slaves' teachings, that's the fancy title for those eight guys I referenced earlier, then Jehovah, that's the name for the Father, will remember you in his mind and will remake you when he remakes the earth at the end of all things. There is no heaven for you, and there is no hell either. When you die, you cease to exist just like everyone else. But if you were an obedient member of the rank and file, you will be remade on the new earth, set aside for faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. The only people who are allowed to go to heaven are members of the anointed class, or rather members of the governing body, as well as other leadership and individuals who know that they are elite. Their knowledge of such things is secret, untestable, and it is seen as poor form to try and measure how many folks have died claiming this elite status since only precisely 144,000 people qualify to go to heaven. Truth stands separate from scrutiny. To use any outside source from the governing body in order to test, measure, or otherwise criticize any false prophecy is to have a false spirit, and you risk expulsion from the group. And by expulsion, I mean expulsion in the harshest sense. This process is known as disfellowshipping. When this happens, your family, friends, and any other members of the community of Jehovah's Witnesses are to treat you as though you are dead. No communication, no discussion, no contact. Which means if you've grown up a Jehovah's Witness and you wish to exit the group, the only way out is by giving up your family. This includes your parents, your spouse, and any children that were born within the Jehovah's Witness framework. This means that if you are a teenager and you've grown up in the group, you have to forfeit everything you've ever known simply to test to see if the claims of the governing body are true. Do not ever be mean or cruel or dismissive to any Jehovah's Witnesses coming to your door in this community. The people who are coming to you are some of the most trapped and spiritually abused human beings in the world, and they have no frame of reference that this is the case. They are existing in a framework that has a myriad of boxes to check off for performance every week, 
and they are existing in a framework fueled by fear of Armageddon and by a genuine concern to persuade the rest of us that they are the world's only lifeboat. And all of this is fueled by the perpetual and bald-faced lying of their founders and leadership. They are well-meaning folks, just like you or I, who just want to be obedient to the task at hand, just like us. They just don't know that the tasks they are being given are by taskmasters, making them their slaves to line their pockets with yet more money. That's right, this is about money. The witnesses pride themselves on the fact that the materials they hand you at your door are free. What they do not tell you is that they themselves were the ones who paid for them. Initially, their original founder, Charles Taze Russell, an eccentric businessman who in the late 1800s insulated his students, then called Bible students, from the world while he coerced them into purchasing a product he called Miracle Wheat. A type of wheat seed that was promised to supply you with five times the amount of crop as other wheat seeds. The ploy was this, if he could convince his students to buy this miracle wheat and he placed ads in the books that they were already trying to sell as Bible study curriculum for yet more miracle wheat and he sold the wheat at a price much higher than the average cost of a bushel because his students were primed with the information that it was so special, then he would be able to have a steady supply of income that was feeding his publication house and him while simultaneously being able to claim that he took no income for himself from the proceeds. You see, if you launder money through what you're calling a Christian missionary framework, then, you know, then no one has any cause to find fault. That was until someone called him out on his glaring fraud. They went to court, and he was exposed for his deception. Did you know that no financial oversight is a normal, initial, telltale sign you're dealing with a religious cult? Religious cults are so common that an entire foundation called the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability was started to track which groups had open books and were willing to subject themselves to outside scrutiny and which did not. What you are seeing right now is an ECFA emblem and accreditation for this emblem means that you can trust who you are dealing with financially right now. You will notice that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society or the Jehovah's Witnesses does not have this along with every other mainstream religious cult in America. The point is, this group's founder was a fraud to begin with. The leadership through the last 140 years has reflected that fraud, and in its current form, those who serve the governing body's ploys would have no way to know that this is happening since one of the teachings is to avoid any websites, publications, or people who criticize the group for any prolonged period of time. Their adherents are told specifically not to Google Jehovah's Witnesses. They are told not to Google members, including, but not limited to, their own governing body member, Raymond Franz, who, after being raised a Jehovah's Witness, convinced that they were God's mouthpiece on earth and that their mission was to help deliver their neighbors from destruction, was elected and entered his first governing body session, prepared to hear directly from Jehovah only to find out that the entire thing was a farce and Jehovah wasn't and hadn't been showing up at all. At that time in Jehovah's Witnesses history, they were getting ready for their latest Armageddon prediction, the year 1975. And when Franz had finally been exposed to the lies, his response was to do the only thing he could think of as a leader, begin searching the Bible for what he had been taught. He had reached a crisis of conscience and this was what he had to say. I had spent nearly 40 years as a full-time representative, serving at every level of organizational structure. The last 15 years I had spent at the international headquarters and the final nine as those of a governing body member for Jehovah's Witnesses. It was those final years that were the crucial period of time for me. Illusions there met up with reality. I have since come to appreciate the rightness of the quotation I recently read, one made by a statesman now dead who said, the enemy, the great enemy of truth, is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. I now began to realize how large a measure of what I had been based my entire adult life course on was just that, a myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. And what Raymond Franz was articulating then about his experience was right on the money. What makes the Jehovah's Witnesses successful is a meticulously designed framework for new recruits. He described it then as persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. But we in this field describe it now with the words coercive control and undue influence. 
This is because the meticulously designed framework the governing body uses is a form of very real and very effective mind control. Hold up, mind control? Anna, do you mean like brainwashing? Yeah, that's precisely what I'm getting at, only this framework is actually not brainwashing per se. That's a little bit of a different process technically. This framework, the one we're talking about with the witnesses, does not have a formal name yet. We are still in the trying to decipher how to ethically run clinical trials to test this phenomenon phase. Let me explain. Psychology is a formal study. A modern academic pursuit on a clinical level is still in its infancy. We're growing exponentially in knowledge to be certain, but if you're around clinicians in this field for very long, you'll notice that we are the first to volunteer the fact that this field is a pioneer field. The field of studying cult indoctrination is even more new and nuanced. So new, in fact, that yours truly is one of the researchers helping design frameworks to educate the general public, practice therapy effectively, and approach the Bible, all while taking all of this changing environment in stride. So, what I'm about to show you may indeed be really foreign to you, but it is my hope that you'll take what you're learning tonight into your own respective fields and educating the people you're in contact with so that we can move forward together as a team in this community. Okay, so quick history lesson. The study of modern psychology, as far as clinical level stuff is concerned, began roughly at the turn of the last century. About 50 years into that study, clinicians began noticing a distinct phenomenon of mind control in prisoner of war cases coming out of prison camps in Maoist China. If you don't know anything about that regime, I highly recommend reading about it. Human torture was at an all-time high, and this regime had figured out how to make American soldier POWs behave, speak, and think in bizarre ways. It was as though they had been turned into puppets suddenly. And researchers began trying to isolate what was happening such that Chinese communist authorities were able to turn American soldiers into something else as a mind control of sorts, even to the point that the soldiers would cooperate with their captors or defect to the enemy when they could have fought. The term brainwashing was thusly coined, a literal translation of this process that the Chinese described as washing the brains of those who did not have the right thinking or thinking that was contrary to the work and movement of communism in the world at large. So they were reforming the thoughts of American soldiers such that those thoughts would then be the driving force behind the prisoner's choices and so that they would be obedient and compliant to their captors even to the point of demonstrating a desire to remain with their captors when they had the opportunity to leave. Even to the point of trying to convince other prisoners to join their ranks or to write letters home to their loved ones, trying to convince them to join them in the prison. These captors were attempting, and apparently succeeding, to re-educate and turn the worldview of an American from their home worldview into a specifically Maoist one. And they were doing this successfully using very specific types of psychological torture. Robert J. Lifton, the premier clinician at the time, isolating what was happening during this process, noted that it didn't matter how hard or successful the POW's captors were, that the POW was only controllable if he stayed in the environment of being close to those who had tortured him. Once out of the ca uh, captor's vicinity, the POW's mindset would slowly return to normal on their own without any clinical intervention. It was as though the prisoner was dissociating from his American identity in order to cope with the trauma of prolonged torture and that this disassociation was only occurring when his mind knew that the torture was still a threat. It was a proximity thing. And in this dissociation, a new identity was formed, sort of like putting on a costume and acting in a play as someone else where the American was playing the role of a compliant Chinese communist going about their day and teaching other POWs to do the same and also never breaking character. Their consciousness was literally manufacturing a safe space in which to exist that was inaccessible to themselves and the outside world so long as they were in proximity to the source of the torture. Once the torture was no longer a threat, the dissociation would disappear, and the American POW would return to his original identity on his own. 
And interestingly enough, one of the features of this phenomenon was that the American identity would not have a knowledge of the other one. Amnesia, or the sense that their brain had gone into a fog-like or dream-like state, was reported when they were asked what happened while they were under the control of the alternative identity. And since these initial documented cases, we have seen many, many more. The point being, and your takeaway from this should be that there does indeed exist a human psychological phenomenon whereby a human being's brain can be successfully elicited into engaging in this disassociative coping process, a process we don't fully understand yet on a chemical level. And it can be done by mimicking the same procedures Maoist prison camps use to experiment on Korean War veterans, either purposely or accidentally. The problem, of course, being that clinicians and researchers cannot mimic these procedures in a controlled lab experiment to figure this out because those procedures are unethical. Plus, our federal government already tried that once in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and so many people committed suicide from it and what they were experiencing that this dark chapter of American history had to be shut down. If you really want to run down a rabbit hole this evening, go ahead and Google or YouTube MKUltra LSD experiments to see what I mean. For our purposes tonight, though, your takeaway is that there exists a process that is latent in every human brain such that they can be coerced into behaving, thinking, reasoning, and living in complete compliance with people who are actually torturing them psychologically. And they, in turn, are delivering to others the very mechanisms for that torture to recruit others into this group as well. Don't believe me? Let me give you an example of just how little it takes to induce an inactive or uncritical mental state without overt torture. Have you ever sat in a class and after everyone goes to leave that class, you realize you didn't know how much time had passed and hadn't heard a word of the lecture because the specific way of the professor's voice was droning, combined with your body's chemistry put you into a sort of empty trance? How about when you're driving on a road trip and you realize suddenly you have no memory of the previous 50 miles you just drove? You never fell asleep, and you never ceased driving the car. Your brain simply lapsed into a different place. Or how about that one time in college where you got a wild hair and convinced your roommate to go with you and your buddies to the beach, and you stayed up for two days just to drive there in order to see the sunrise, and you experienced a sudden and inexplicable euphoria on the morning of that third day that you've wanted to experience again. It was so wonderful. That one that put you into a daze so lovely you actually had a hard time getting to sleep in the motel room even though you knew that you were extremely exhausted. Those states are induced by your environment. That environment in turn elicits a neurochemical response and that neurochemical response subjects your consciousness to involuntary and very real emotional changes that then drive your behavior. If we can catch you in this Goldilocks zone, that neurochemical environment, and we then hand you a fully articulated new identity by which your brain equates the new identity with that euphoric trance, congratulations, you now have the exact same disassociative scenario that the American POWs we talked about earlier were experiencing. Only this time, there's no clear enemy available for your brain to form a way out protocol. So now you have two identities, your old true self and your new cult identity. But you're not cognizant of the change, which means when we remove you from the environment where you were given your second identity, your brain never triggers that it's safe to go back to the way you were before. And this is why I initially said that we're not really dealing with brainwashing per se when we are talking about cult mind control we are dealing with a much more complicated and sophisticated form of brainwashing. Where in brainwashing, the victim is always aware of their enemy in this phenomenon. The victim experiences the same chemical occurrence as the POW, only that in this scenario, the victim doesn't realize they are experiencing psychological torture, nor are they perceiving their torturers as enemies, but rather they're perceiving them as friends. We are dealing with that persistent, persuasive yet unrealistic phenomenon that Raymond Franz was referencing, we are dealing with what my colleagues and I are calling that unnamed phenomenon as well. Coercive control and undue influence. This is how cults work. 
they elicit that normal human response. They then take advantage of that chemical state by providing the person with a new identity in the cult. And they then subject them to disguised psychological torture in the form of controlling every aspect of the person's life so that they cannot get out. And so that they will feed whatever mechanism the guru or leadership is trying to maintain power with for the length of their stay in the group, making it near impossible for those of us on the outside to get them out. Because as far as they know, they want to be there, and they're simply surrounded by very serious and very committed believers doing the same thing. This is why damaging cults focus their recruitment on college campuses a lot. In order to elicit that chemical state I've been telling you about, you normally need only three factors. Poor diet, sleep deprivation, and removal from the family unit. You can do this through physical torture, or you can look at the lifestyle of your average 18-year-old. Oh look, college students are like that all the time. Amazing. No wonder depression rates are so high. They're away from their families and have very little practice taking care of their bodies on their own, and they normally have no idea that sleep deprivation and a high sugar diet can put you into a chronic stupor-like state, not to mention your circadian rhythms are what regulate your mood. Once invited to some sort of introductory meeting, there they, the new recruit is subjected to what is called love bombing which is an unreasonable level of members of the group finding you immediately interesting, complimenting you, inviting you to parties, or generally showing you an exceedingly dialed up level of attention. After that, you are normally invited, um, immediately invited to some type of next steps process where there is some promise that someone you haven't met yet will be thrilled to meet you. After this point, a combination of factors are used dependent upon the group's leadership preferences, a process known as loading the language, begins to be exposed at greater and greater depth to the new recruit. Loading the language is when they use familiar terminology to the recruit, but that terminology has a specific and very different meaning in the cult's teachings than in the way the recruit would use it normally. This happens primarily in Bible-based cults. You'll hear Christian language everywhere, but the definitions of those words are very different than what Christianity actually teaches. The group will surround you with very articulate higher members in the group where it will become clear to the new recruit that they know a great deal more than them, that self-purpose or individuality is actually self-centered and too based to be real, that the group has put aside such childish notions to live for the greater good of the whole, and that this group's notion of whatever that means has given them so much purpose and understanding that there is no other group to whom you can belong and have any chance of being saved from the world's destruction. And once inside, you find out that you didn't receive all of the information about the group up front, but rather they had to keep things from you that you were not ready yet to receive because you were not on the same spiritual level that they were, and so deception was necessary to save you. Case in point, the second local cult group that needs a kind, gentle, and firmly bold kick in the spiritual rear end. Young Jin Moon, otherwise known as Pastor Sean of Sanctuary Church in Rod of Iron Ministries. Sean is a very articulate, well-mannered, and well-educated graduate of theology from Harvard. He is fully aware of what Christianity actually teaches and how his father, Sun Young Moon, manipulated millions of people to follow him as the Messiah instead. Those of you who grew up in the 80s, you remember the Moonies? Those guys that would sponsor mass weddings of thousands of strangers to one another in order to purify bloodlines and try to bring about the end of the world? Yeah, those guys. Pastor Sean is the kid who received anointing as the second incarnation of the Messiah before his father died, which means he is the true inheritor of that religious heritage as well as a king among men. Pastor Sean's father taught that at 15 years old, he had received an anointing directly from Jesus to carry out his unfinished work on the planet. Jesus had failed, you see, by being crucified without having accomplished his true purpose, to find a woman to reverse the problem of original sin. Because the true need for a Messiah was due to the fact that Adam and Eve's sin in the garden was not disobedience, but rather that Eve had literally mated with a serpent and her offspring was now genetically sinful. So sin is not a matter of morality. Sin is a matter of genetics. The role Jesus was supposed to play was to become a second Adam and find a second Eve from which would come children without genetic sin. 
But due to the whole getting crucified incident, that mission had not been accomplished. So the next incarnation of Jesus to make the attempt again was to fall on moon, where he would have to spend his time connecting sexually with as many women as possible in order to find the Holy Spirit or the true mother or the true Eve. Yeah. <laughs> from whom the newly genetically pure generation would arise. I love that all the women in here rolled their eyes simultaneously. If you become a follower of Moon, the successful Messiah, then you will be honorarily given the title true person, and you will be connected with another true person of the opposite sex so that you can also get going on this whole producing children within the group to purify sin and genetics and our heritage and all that. Hence, all the mass weddings. Oh, and also the two people who were crucified next to Jesus, they represent communism and capitalism. The guy who mocked Jesus represents communism, and the thief who identified Jesus for who he was represents capitalism. There's a lot more to this, but we're running out of time. So just hold that last detail in the back of your minds, because it will be important in a moment. This brings us to Pastor Sean and his church, and what I am lovingly entitling this movement, The Moonies Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. Pastor Sean had a falling out of sorts with the Holy Spirit, which is his mother, remember, and decided that since he is the second incarnation of the true Messiah, that he should rebrand since his mother still has millions of followers in South Korea. So he announced to the Unification Church that his father had made a mistake, that actually his mother is the whore of Babylon, and that he is moving the true church to here in the States, where he as Messiah would enact the declaration of the constitution of Chunilguk, which means one heavenly kingdom in Korean. Where the focus of the church would be to enlighten as many people as possible to the fact that a war is coming between the political left, communism, and the political right, capitalism where the true church would align with the political right because, as Pastor Sean will be the first to tell you during what is often three to four hour long sermons, if you are a Christian and you believe Jesus is God, then you cannot deny the scriptures where Jesus himself said and created the assault weapon. And by this he means that he has received revelation as the second incarnation of the Messiah, that the iron scepter in Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, is specifically an AR-15. And if you are a Christian, it's your duty to protect your church and your flock with your AR-15, which is why you should bring your AR-15 to the special blessing services for your guns, and also why when you join his peace police, which are the local militias he is forming, before you discharge your weapon, you are to recite, love God, love your neighbor. And the most interesting part of this story is that this is the point where I bring you back around to that initial point that I made at the beginning of this talk where an alert came across my desk that made me jump about a 130-acre compound that was purchased in Granger County. Yeah, it was purchased by Pastor Sean where he intends to build a retreat center and divinity school to try and raise up local politicians to advance his group's aims. I am not a prophet, but let's just do a quick thought experiment about how successful a cult using all of the tactics I've just outlined, but packaging them in the form of a conservative Christian, pro-gun, pro-family, pro-kingdom of God here on earth, anti-leftist, there's a civil war coming, and we'll teach you how to kill people more effectively in the name of Jesus group, is going to go over here in East Tennessee. Y'all, this has dumpster fire on steroids in the making written all over it. Waco, Texas, remember the Branch Davidians? They ain't got nothing on what this guy's gonna bring. Um, and this is all being designed to elicit our community's approval. We cannot, as church leaders, fail to speak. We cannot be complicit while charlatans like the cult leaders we have discussed tonight continue to make ground while we remain silent. We must battle this nonsense by doing what the Apostle Paul advised Titus to do. We teach sound doctrine. We speak sound doctrine. We do not get lost in niceness because we're afraid that explaining sound doctrine might distress the person we're speaking with. We must be kind, gentle, bold, and firm when it comes to those in our midst who have self-elected to call themselves spiritual leaders when it is self-evident to all who hear them that the Holy Spirit, um, from the, that they claim to be hearing from the Holy Spirit when they're not. We have to fight as congregants the desire to hear only smooth things. 
we must move, train, and perspire in our studies of this book such that everyone we meet will be able to provide them with what they need by way of knowledge of Yahweh. And just to be clear, these two groups we've talked about tonight are only the biggest groups in our area. We haven't even touched the 12 tribes in Chattanooga. Those are the guys who try to recruit you while you're hiking in the National Park or in Yellow Delis across the country. Or the Church of the Remnant in Brentwood who have begun a cult only focused on gluttony and will starve you to death and have been successful in doing so. Or the Mormons and Christian Scientists and World Mission Society Church of God right here in Knoxville. Or the Branhamites in Johnson City. And there are more. This is only the beginning. Which means if you find yourself wondering, what purpose does God have for me here in little old Maryville, Tennessee? Well, perhaps this is it. And I would be happy to train you. And if you are attending tonight and you've come out of a group like the ones I've described, and you are alone and need help and someone to talk with who knows what you've experienced wasn't crazy, it was spiritual abuse, then I'm pleased to announce our new office downtown where I can help you through the exit counseling process as a therapist who specializes in just that. You are not alone, and I promise that everyone I introduce you to won't love bomb you into another cult, and the best part is I will never ask you to trust me on that promise. I will ask you to test me every meeting, and the truth of my claim will be evident over time if I am telling the truth. You don't need to trust me ever. Throw everything you can possibly think of at me and simply observe. You are not broken beyond repair. What you have experienced is not permanent. And the fact that you have gone through what you have and are even sitting in the audience tonight is a testimony to your strength. And you need to hear someone volunteer that observation over and over again. This is no small thing what you've done. This is magnificence in the making. Keep going. With that being said, I have one last thing to point out before we open up for Q&A, and that is that some of you are sitting there saying to yourself that this entire concept that any human can be mind-controlled is bananas. You're sitting there thinking there is no way I would ever fall for that level of influence over my life. Cults are for the weak-minded, non-critical types, the gullible types. And I'm not one of those. So although this has been a very entertaining exercise in the human experience, I'm definitely an exception to that rule. And maybe you are, but I doubt it. And I'm willing to bet that actually you're a card-carrying member of the largest American cult in existence. This mind control cult has been around for four centuries and engages in the seasonal breaking of child labor laws, excessive and in most cases obsessive focus on the details surrounding the care of lifestyle choices of the guru who founded the group long after his death and is most famous for the quotes, it's legal because I wish it and has God forgotten everything I did for him? The cult's activities serve zero purpose to the greater community by way of any pragmatic services. The only driving pressure to perform for this cult comes by way of generational pressure. You were raised in the cult, or by way of pressure from other practicing members of the cult around you. And so devoted to performance are you to this pressure that some of us pour hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of our lifetime into performing well under pressure and in the maintenance it takes to achieve that level of performance dare I say torture. On top of this, and this is going to hurt, so breathe in. Some of us will make certain our tasks for this cult are done to satisfaction over reading our own Bibles. We'll say to ourselves, oh, I don't have time for study, while simultaneously making time to satisfy the cult's expectations. We also teach our children to continue the guru's work and do the same in their households. And all so that the guru who taught that our self-worth and evidence that our lives were put together to those around us is found in our ability to import, maintain, and worship with our time, our pocketbooks, and our attitudes an exotic vegetable that serves no other purpose than being visually pleasing to the guru, who I will remind you has been dead for four centuries. I am speaking, of course, of American lawn care or as I would like to now label it, the cult of Louis XIV, who, in the 17th century, wished to demonstrate to the world his grandeur and so made at the Palace of Versailles an unreasonably difficult lawn that was cut by servants by hand with scythes for no other reason than the fact that he could, and it was a testament to his godhood. 
the rest of the world, desiring also to demonstrate their opulence, tried to mimic his ridiculous exercise in redundancy. And to this day, the tradition of a well-manicured grass lawn is a sign that the person who owns the property has it together enough to be considered respectable. Heaven help you if you don't want to pour hours and money into keeping a small field of completely useless and non-native plants alive just for social stigma. You see? <laughs> Mind control is for everyone. No one is an exception. The Lord says if your hand and feet cause you to sin, cut them off. So too with your eye, if it causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it's better for us to enter life with one eye and crippled than to have our bodies intact and find ourselves in hell. May I politely suggest to you something way less difficult. If you cannot find time to study the scriptures and move forward in your sanctification process, then begin by timing how long it takes for you to mow your lawn, then pluck out the grass and devote the time you used to spend to its care on the Bible instead. But that's just a suggestion. All right, let's open up for some Q&A. I don't have any plants tonight to break the ice. All right, do it. Go, Kim, go. You don't have to go to a mic. It's okay, I can hear you. I'll repeat your question. So, are we not allowing our school districts to do the same thing to our children? Indoctrinate them? Mind control? Teaching certain things over other certain things we're not letting them teach? It's possible. It happens all the time. We'd have to assess it on a case-by-case -case basis, but yes, it's, po it's highly possible. Sure. I've even seen this the framework used in churches that are not cults just because they've noticed that it works. That's one of the hard parts about doing this work and educating the public is because you get social engineering material that'll just kind of trickle down through different, um, different avenues, but just people who are very well-meaning being like, oh, look, this really worked really well for our church. We have a lot of people and they're all performing really well. And it's like, if you call me in to do an assessment, I'll break down exactly what's happening normally. But, I mean, there aren't very many of us out there. The International Cultic Studies Association, I brought some things here. Here's the, the Moonies material. Here's the group that just bought Hiawasi College. I'm still doing an assessment. I don't know if they're a cult group yet. They're called the Bruderhofs, which means brotherhood. And they're like a, they're gonna look like a Mennonite spinoff. I'm still doing an assessment there to see what's going on. But um, this is that, the ICSA, International Cultic Studies Association, this is my colleagues. And all we do is do this work, educating the public on what's going on. So it's entirely possible that that's happening in school systems. It's entirely possible it's happening a lot of other places too. We just have to break it down on a case-by-case -case basis. Make sense? Yep. There is no way, oh, okay, good, Abby's got a question. Thank you, Abby. They can be. Anything can be turned into a cult, really. And we have breakdowns in, in my field of like what we mean by cult. So it's not just groups that Anna doesn't like. That's not what a cult is. Uh, we actually have like a framework, and it's called a BITE model. B standing for behavior, I standing for information, T standing for thinking, E standing for emotion. And you assess a person and, or group um, by that model, and it's a sliding scale framework. So you can get to a point where the person has become so obsessive that that bite model qualifies in the cult area. You can also get cults of personality. So for example, when I was lecturing in Manchester, I got teamed up with a guy I didn't know whose entire talk was the cult of Trump. He had written an entire book that this was actually, and I mean this in a, in a clinical level, he was assessing different individuals and how the response of these individuals to this particular politician was going down. So you can take out Trump. It's not that Trump is specifically bad, it's just that he was assessing that one. Um, so yes, politics can be a cult. It also cannot be. It gets, it gets hairy, but that's the point, is we take these on a case-by-case -case basis and we get really detailed. We don't want to make big, broad statements because that's not helpful. Go for it. Come on up. OK. Um, so when I was in college, um, a friend told me that their friend had a job opportunity for them. And they said, I don't want it, but you can have it. 
So I went, and it was, a, it was like a little seminar, definitely a pyramid scheme. <laughs> and I called it out, um, but what would you suggest if, like, somebody ended up in that situation again? Like, do you just say it out loud in front of everybody? I wouldn't. Normally, the breakdown for cult stuff, so if you're in, if you go to the seminar, and it's the initial seminar, and you've got a field of new recruits, yes, great, wonderful. If you've got a close friend who is eyeballs deep in all of their finances being tied up in a multi-level marketing scheme, that's really just a pyramid scheme, right? Um, that's a different protocol because you have to make certain that you're understanding that what you're about to tell them is life altering and you're shattering their reality and you don't want to just be like look at what you were duped by because that'll put up barriers that are not helpful and you won't be able to talk to them anymore because it's too much too fast so okay. what you want to do is say how are you doing that must be extremely difficult what's it like to be spending that many hours and that much money devoted to a single source what's the rest of your life look like get them to start assessing like, how painful is this experience? Because it's very painful. That's where you start. And that way you're building the trust that you understand what they're going through before you go, so I Googled it, and this is bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Great, great question. Hey. Um, do you ever see this on, like, an individual basis? So, like, rather than someone coming under the influence of a cult, meeting an individual who presents themselves as kind of like a spiritual leader? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you can have, obviously in order to have a cult, you have to have a cult leader. And you can have what's called cults of personality like I just talked about a second ago. Um, and this is like you're meeting or seeing a cult being started or attempting to be started in real time. It hasn't gotten there yet mm -hmm. and you can't quite formalize it. In the field we call it, it's the people that are so narcissistic, it's almost unnerving. Like they just, they meet you and they're like, I can teach you so many things. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's called malignant narcissism. It's a very specific quality. And it's a, normally a feature of mental illness. So even in those cases, um, you're still wanting to be extra nice to the person who you're talking to on the one-to-one -one because they may be suffering on a level that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. For example, Jim Jones. We can tell now, we couldn't at the time, but we can tell now reviewing the, the tapes that he made of himself because he was so obsessed with hearing and, and assessing, he was is rapid onset schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. He was actually suffering, but nobody could get to them or help them, and so the whole Jonestown thing was just this horrible, perfect storm mm -hmm. of a mentally ill leader diving into schizophrenia and nobody being able to do anything about it. So yes, that can happen, and yes, keep an eye on that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, not always mental illness. I'm not saying that that automatically is the case. Sometimes people are just really arrogant. But as a Christian, you know, when you're trying to come talk to somebody about that, yeah, you have to be cognizant and aware that those are possibilities. Um, same thing with Scientology, right? L. Ron Hubbard wrote to the American Psychological Association before he started Scientology that he was hearing voices and nobody would help him. He was suffering. And that's the founder of Scientology. Okay, so go Leah, go. Yay. Go Leah, go. So you know our, I mean, you know our, our background and our story. Mm -hmm. And um, so ours is, mine's going to main, mainly deal with where we're, where we're from. I say where we're from. We're a military family, so we've only been in Tennessee about six years. Mm -hmm. But we live in Cleveland, and it's Church of God headquarters, mm -hmm. uh, home to Perry Stone and the other Prosperity Word of Faith preachers, which is... For me, it's, for us, it's very cult-like. You can be as honest as you <laughs> okay, want. Okay, thank you. So after we've come out of this, after about a year ago, and, um, and, and if you don't think you can be logical and get caught up in something, you're looking at it. We're, I'm probably the most black and white person, but we allowed our daughter to join a cult. <laughs> Unknowingly, we didn't realize that's what they were as a traveling ministry out of our church. And without giving any, any specifics, that happened about a year ago. We are still considered the enemy because we have spoke out and we have taken a stand against this specific ministry. And um, there are so many in that in our city. And I know I'm getting ready to start my YouTube channel. Um, I'm so nervous about doing it because 
I'm the enemy in Cleveland, Tennessee, according mm -hmm. to anyone that's a part of that type of ministry. And I mean, I've had people reach out to me and tell me, you know, you're pushing us, your post and the things you say are just pushing people away. Mm -hmm. No matter how loving, no matter how just, you know, mm -hmm. doctrine, this is it. I'm not, don't be mad at me, be mad at, mm -hmm. <laughs> at what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a Jezebel spirit, I'm pushing people away, I'm the enemy. And so my question is, how do I go about it to this point now where I can now share a YouTube channel in hopes of helping the people in this community? It's very difficult, there are so many, and I just, it blows my mind that here's the truth in front of you, and no one wants to follow. I mean, these pastors don't follow the Titus protocol or, or the Bible. I, there's so many. Mm -hmm. And I mean, out of 356 churches in Cleveland, Tennessee alone, we have finally found one that teaches, ex, you know, an expository preaching. Mm -hmm. And we're like, where have y'all been? Where has this church been all, you know, but I want to help and I want to be able to speak out, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to do it in love. Mm -hmm. But how do you do that when you're, you're the enemy? exactly like that. You explain all the things that you're afraid of being and that you don't want to be. You demonstrate compassion and truthfulness, full transparency. You tell the story and you just say, this, these are what's going on, these are the facts. Because you have no idea how the Lord's moving and how he's working in people's hearts and minds in the background. All we do is we tell the truth and we do so in a way that is that we keep ourselves accountable to this. And if you are doing that, then it doesn't matter what they have to say to you. I know it hurts, it's awful. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy at all. But you keep saying that, I'm trying to do this. Here's what, I, and I may be failing, and just stay humble. This is what I'm trying to do, this is what I'm reading, this is what I experience, and nobody's helping me. Because what will happen when you did the hard work, when it was hardest, and no one believed you, was that you will make yourself a beachhead, a spiritual beachhead where you are. And as things come and break down in these groups, and I know what happened with you all, and it will break down. It may take a while, but it will. The Lord doesn't let that sit for very long, if you've noticed. Um, you'll have established yourself as a beachhead already, which means all the people who are silent, who don't have the spine that you do, now have a place to go to talk. It's a wonderful gift. Okay. Wonderful gift. Just tell the truth exactly like that. Right, thank you. You're welcome. I got one. Okay. So, uh, this rod of iron mm -hmm. ministries, mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of touched on the fact that maybe they're utilizing some of the cultural touchstones here in our community to sort of maybe give them an inroad. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems very extreme. Mm -hmm. And if anyone, um, there, it, it doesn't seem subtle. If anyone with say a bit of Christian background, mm -hmm. Uh, they should quickly recognize, mm -hmm. maybe not, but they should quickly recognize this. they're not coming from a profoundly Christian perspective. But there are other groups and churches, frankly, that yeah. are hitting on some of those same cultural touchstones through Christian nationalism, which I know we've talked about here before. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious, like, at, at what point would you maybe shift gears from saying... Um, hey, this is a, these are Christian brothers and sisters who we love a whole lot, but maybe we disagree on some stuff, to, hey, maybe we disagree on a lot of stuff, to, mm -hmm. oh, now we need to sound an alarm um, because a threshold has been crossed. I really struggle with trying to, yeah. to decide where those lines are, yeah. but particularly as it pertains to Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. it seems to be become more and more blatant and bold mm -hmm. and I, I have no idea frankly where that line is mm -hmm. like on, on that on that category in particular what are you looking for before you go hey wait a minute maybe there's like some scope creep mm -hmm. <laughs> and vision being lost versus oh no this is a different faith yeah the only way I can tell for that line is to talk to them in person and pray I don't know how else to do it. I can't do an assessment. Like, you guys can't send me a YouTube video and be like, is this a cult? You know, and they're doing an entire sermon series on 
the president or something like that? Because the answer is I can't assess whether that was a poor judgment call that was momentary or that this, this is, maybe this was something like a, a bug got this preacher's ear, right? And then they, they, he's taken off and he probably shouldn't be going that far, but he is. I, the only way I can do it is to call a meeting and sit down and say, I'm your friendly neighborhood apologist. I know you don't care what I have to say. This doesn't look like sound doctrine to me. What's going on? Because I'm a little worried and I'm going to have to be required by this to like warn my congregation if this is what it might be. And I really hope it's not that. Could you just help me mm-hmm. understand where your distinctions are? Yeah. That's the only way I know how to do it. Yeah. yeah, with Christian nationalism, my concern, like this rod of iron ministry seems to be coming. Okay, it might pick up some, some radical fringe, but some of the Christian nationalism stuff seems to be coming right down the middle. And, um, yeah. and it's, I'm, I'm concerned about it, but I also, I don't really know what to do. So anyway, that's, that's helpful. I wish I had something to tell you that was more helpful than that. That's all I've got. I will say, if you're interested, because you're good, I think you're pretty good at assessing sermons and um, stuff, pick up one of his sermons and you'll be shocked at A, how many people are there. Oh, Rod of Iron, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have to listen to the four, four hours or no. anything, but he, he is wonderful at manipulation. <laughs> he is a master class. And he'll do things like, well, Jesus invented the assault weapon. And you're like, what? And he's like, turn with me. You know the scripture. Where he takes off his belt and he starts beating people in the temple and flipping tables. That's an assault weapon. He's taking care of us that way. We have a responsibility to take care of others with our assault. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's slippery, man. It's not, and he doesn't talk about the Mooney stuff. Like, he looks totally normal. He'll wear a sweatshirt. And talk in the middle of the group. He, he forms this as a circle church. Stands in the center. Anyway, check it out. Because it's, it's more effective than we realize until I summarize all of the theology he's not saying in the sermons. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yep. That's why I do this. Sounds a whole lot different. If you get the full picture up front, that's usually a sign that you're in a cult. Is if you can look back. If you're looking at the, and you're assessing the group that you're in, and you're like, is this a cult? Just ask yourself, if I knew everything that I know now, when I joined this group, would I have joined? If the answer is no, you're probably in a cult. I'll try not to drop it. Go for it. Yeah, I, I might have missed what you said. Sorry. It's okay. But the... I did a lot. <laughs> The Jehovah Witnesses, you talked about their governing body, Mm -hmm. and then you talked about the followers. And the followers, according to them, are not going to heaven. It's only the governing body? It's only the governing body, along with people who know that they're elite, and you only, they just know. How do they become a governing leadership there? Do they get appointed? Do they say... I'm ready to die, I name you? No, yes, kind of. So the governing body members handpick the next governing body members. And that happened, that was a big change after Raymond France. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now they won't let anybody in, which is why they're down to eight members. There's there's too much out there now, too many lawsuits, too many people like me. (laughs) Brittany. Yeah. So I'm thinking what's going to happen when they. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. They moved, that used to be, headquarters used to be in Brooklyn, New York, and they were somewhat visually available. They have since sold that building and moved to upstate New York into like this compound in the woods that nobody can find. So I think they're losing money and I think they're losing adherence. I think that's what's actually happening. Um, there's just too many YouTube videos and too many people who have been disfellowshipped and t- too much child abuse. The entire um, continent of Australia, for example, is in a lawsuit with the Watchtower Bible Tract Society right now for the amount of um, pedophile cases they hid. Like, there's no way out when it gets that big. And as mamas in this room, you know what happens when somebody abuses your baby. Like, that's the first sign that somebody's going down usually. I suspect that's what's going to happen, just because those are active cases. Hmm? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, yeah. Chris? 
So you know we've worked with college students for a long time and mm -hmm. things like that, and we love our local church that we have our children growing up in and things like that, but many of our children go way to college. And, you know, you, there's that piece where you got to let them go. But at the same time, can you make suggestions on how we can parent, say, our high school kids or our middle school kids as they're getting ready to maybe go off to college, things like that, on how to find a, a solid local church? What are bullet point things that you would recommend for us to teach our kids about how to find a good local church? The reason I say all this is I've seen so many kids grow up in the local church and then immediately when they leave and go away from home, like mm -hmm. away meaning like miles and miles away, mm -hmm. this is when they get caught up in cults or they get caught up or they just leave the local church in general. Yeah. So. Yeah, normally that's that's what they leave for the most part, yeah. So, wonderful question. Um, a lot of the preemptive strike can happen before they leave since you know where they're going. Just to do a little research on what's going on. Most most churches have some type of sermon podcast or something just to like check out the group if you're like, only, you only have standalone non-denominational churches and any of them could be a mess. You have no idea. You normally have the ability to kind of listen to sermons and that sort of thing. But you also have available to you Usually, especially in America, if it's an American college campus, um, campus ministries that are parachurch ministries, like Rosho Christi, for example, is a parachurch ministry. And our entire role is to come alongside to make sure your kids have access and we know the area. Now, I'm not saying that that is a foolproof method, but you at least have other Christians who have been vetted theologically to make these, these decisions in a trustworthy manner, at least on the, on the ground level, so that you have jumping points like, stay away from that group, this one seems to be awesome, that sort of thing. So connect with your, the, whatever apologist is in that, in that area, or whatever ministry you already normally work with, because they probably know. Hi. Um, for someone who was in a cult, but it was a while back, mm -hmm. And it's hard to get over some of the stuff that you went through. Yes. What would you suggest? Come to the office. A lot of times what happens in these groups, especially high control groups, like I talked about tonight, there is so significant trauma that you actually have PTSD on, on some level. And what's beautiful about PTSD is it's very treatable on a clinical level, because we have what are called blockages in our minds. These are circuits. These are the way thoughts move. And blockages occur. There's scars over those circuits. And blockages are what we want to make us. We want the circuit to arrive at a point, hit the blockage, and go around it so that you never have to deal with that thought again, especially per pervasive thoughts that you're having to repeat. If that's a phenomenon that somebody you know is experiencing, then you can come get treatment with Anna Kiko, like right now. I'm so excited. Our office is really cool. Where's your office, Downtown Maryville. It's in Morganton Square. It's called First or Full Circle Counseling. And I'm in there under supervision with a couple of other clinicians. But I only take clients that are cult clients because we use the Bible in session. Okay? Morganton Square, Full Circle Counseling. Go for it. Um, I was wondering if you had ever heard about Carrie the Love. Say that again? Carry the love. No. They um, will find local ministry groups okay. um, in colleges, mm -hmm. and they're based out of YWAM Ministries out in California, Okay. and they will ship a bunch of like ministry kids going through their like rebellious Christian stage if we're going to do it all for Jesus, mm -hmm. and they're like taking a gap year to do it, Okay. and they basically love bomb the group as soon as they get there, and okay. then I know because they did it to me. And then they use the students to get to all the other students on campus. Okay. And so, like, the first night is super, like, reading your mail and super spiritual and super charismatic. And then the second night, they basically, like, scare you a lot into, like, whoa, listen to all of this. They actually came to Johnson, and Johnson banned outside groups from coming for a while because it scared a lot of students. 
Yeah. So I didn't know if you'd heard about them or if I they were haven't. on your radar because they've been to Miraville College twice and I can't get over the fact that I invited them there. Um, oh, I know. Isn't it awful? That happens all the time. Please do not beat yourself up about that because a lot of times it happens unexpectedly and you find out about it after the fact, which yeah. is why it's so important to just be like, we got to warn other people about this. But you and I, I, I'm not familiar with that group, but you can tell me more about it and I'll do some research so that it's on my radar and I can be warning. Because they're, they're coming to Carson Newman and everything, then they'll host like, really? giant college worship nights. Mm -hmm. And it's charismatic to the point where it made me question my charismatic um, practices during worship. How many years ago was this? Um, 2017 and 2018. Okay. And... That explains just, a lot, actually. And just 2020 this year at Johnson. Okay. Yeah. I have, I'm the oversight or for, for the state of Tennessee for Russia Christie. So all the apologists in Tennessee, I'm their supervisor. Okay. okay. I lost a whole bunch of chapters here locally all of a sudden, like meaning that like no groups were allowed on campus. Mm -hmm. So we lost it. Carson Newman, Lee. I mean, places where I thought like Russia Christie would be perfect, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And it was just like sudden. I wonder if that was part of it. Probably, because okay. they did visit those colleges this year, and it's a new group with a new head, like, okay. adultier adult yeah. with them each. Yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, if you all could see how many of these groups there actually are, you would be yeah. appalled. Uh, well, I don't know about that particular group, but sometimes, sometimes they're just, a lot of times, I mean, in America, we're a Christian culture, primarily, like our cultural basis has a lot of Christianese woven into it. So if you can start a group and call it a Christian ministry, regardless of the reason for why you started it, you can fly under the radar for an awfully long time, an awfully long time. That may be what that we're talking about with this group. I don't know yet because I haven't done an assessment, but that's probably, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. That's like that's like the Hiawassee group. I don't know if this is just a Moravian group of people or a spinoff of the Hutterites, but it is odd that they got kicked out of the Hutterite denomination. So I'm like, okay, I'll get their books and their gurus' teachings, and I'll do assessment, and then I'll let you know. So um, I was wondering because... Earlier, Speak up a little bit for me. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, earlier you said uh, that it, to get out of a cult, you'd ask yourself, like, I don't exactly remember what you said, but it was like, if you knew the stuff you knew now, if you would have joined the cult or not mm -hmm. earlier. I don't think I've been in a cult, but how would you know if you were in a cult or not if you don't learn anything and you've been there for like a year or so? I don't know. Yeah. Um, you would normally start to pick up on the fact that your questions weren't being answered. And then that would start bothering you. And then if you went to go do research and pursue more information, you would be cut off for some reason. And that should be a giant red flag that you're in a cult group, that information cut off. Because they don't want you to get on your, on your phone and Google the group or whatever. Um, past that, there are usually a ton of people in your life that will say to you while you're in one of these groups, you're in a cult. And you won't, you're like, no, that can't possibly be what's going on. And in those cases, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But in those cases, you want to take the loving care of the people around you who know you the best and go, am I? Let's scrutinize this for a minute, right? Because it's so important that you do. So, say that again. Well, and see, that's, that's the hard one because you're the only person that's getting hurt in doing that, that research as opposed to the people around you telling you, no, 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 don't do any research. Here's the deal. I say this all the time. I'm sure it's getting annoying. Truth does not flee from scrutiny. You are allowed to scrutinize whatever is being claimed to be the truth for as long as you would like, okay? And anybody that stops you from doing that should be looked at in a kind and suspicious manner. Stay kind. It doesn't mean they're trying to mislead you on purpose. But that should be a weird. And you're an individual. And you will answer to God by yourself 
on Judgment Day, right? You won't be surrounded by everybody else. So you can say politely and lovingly to the people who love you around you, if they don't want you to pursue scrutinizing, I love you, but I need to do this. I need to know that it's really true for me. And that's okay, okay? Hey. Hi. So for someone who's going to be moving into the college world in a couple of years and like have lots of friends that are doing that right now, mm -hmm. So from what you said, college seems like the perfect target for all these groups. Is, is there any main specific things to look out for? Maybe not, I mean, if there are groups specifically that go after colleges in particular or just things to look out for. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are lists, and I can give you one of like the main line, the really obvious cult groups that do major recruiting on campuses. For example, if you go to UT, Hare Krishnas are, are actively recruiting right now. And what's funny is that I actually know the recruiters because I was the one who dealt with them in Gainesville when I was in college starting my career. They're the same guys, <laughs> so they know me. <laughs> and so <laughs> in those cases, um, you can just kind of pinpoint, okay, this group does active, active evangelism on campus, and they do, they'll set up like free yoga classes. And it's like, why are you giving free yoga classes? Like, why are they free? And why do I need to have this book by this guru in order to understand? Like, you know what I mean? It, you get these red flags of like, if they're, if they're really working really hard to give you free stuff and show you lots of attention, like, you should suspect that. It might not be bad but you should be suspicious of that. Why are you showing me this much attention? Why are you giving me all this stuff? Like, that's weird. It's weird. Make sure you watch out for, these are just things that we know from the field. Um, watch out for groups that set up right outside counseling centers. Mm. They're looking for students who are struggling. Okay, and that's, that's real easy to recruit from there. So the groups that specifically set up outside of counseling centers that are religious groups that sound weird. They'll wear name tags, like ISKCON name tags, and you'll get to this is the uh, Krishna consciousness name tags, but they'll hide them so that you don't know what to Google. So they're wearing their IDs inside of their sweatshirts, for example. That's a good sign. Yeah, yeah, I'll help you if you want more specifics. That's good. Great question. Yes. Hey, Anna, thank you. Um, I realize with all of these things, there's certainly degrees in cultishness, yes. cultish behaviors, mm -hmm. and that the lines very much probably blur mm -hmm. together. Um, and so recognizing that though, would you say that it's fair that at least in varying degrees, even within evangelical circles, mm -hmm. that there would be some aspect of guilt in this, whether it's um, kind of the way in which people are codified by or organized around specific leaders within the evangelical, yeah. uh, what, regardless of what you think of their theology, right. whether that's a John Piper or a John MacArthur. Yes. Um, as well as even the, um, I can think of like the Southern Baptist tradition mm -hmm. and the way in particular that tradition tends to uh, respond to education for yeah. example, so okay, we're, you can go to Southern Seminary, but if you pursue knowledge at Duke, yes. that's a problem. Yes. Would you would you I'd say that that's a fair assessment that 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 those kinds of I, I, I guess I'm just looking for how and where would you try to draw lines in navigating that those layers of cultishness? Yeah. That's a hard, that's a very complicated question. It's a wonderful point. There are pros and cons to every single denominational tradition. And that's expected. We are given freedom. Romans chapter 14. We are allowed to disagree over secondary and tertiary issues. But what naturally happens to human beings arguing about secondary and tertiary issues is that they forget that they're secondary and tertiary and they start making these like... I think it's meant well, I think it's meant to protect people ultimately, but they start drawing major divisions and distinctions that are just not there. And then all of a sudden that line is there and then over time people forget why that line was placed there and it's not really appropriate anymore because the culture has shifted. Um, and so you'll see that in like, for example, the Southern Baptist um, scenarios with that we only, we can, maybe we can allow that seminary, but we will not touch anything with this name or this pedigree, which is problematic because they should be assessing on an individual basis. But that's so time intensive that people don't want to do that. And it's human nature to say, give me a formula. 
and let me just plug everybody into the formula. I don't know how to do that. I cannot figure out a way to do that safely or in a way that would, that would last longer than maybe a generation. And so we never want to be adding to scripture things that aren't there by way of expectation for Christians. At the same point in time, we, we want to make sure that we're always emphatic about those testing points. So yes, the answer is, can it get cultish? Absolutely. Especially with celebrity preachers. Beware celebrity preachers. Not that they're wrong, just that if you're watching a human being who is supposed to be teaching sound doctrine, and they start being more devoted to how many rear ends are in their seats every Sunday, you have the normal flow of sin through a human being. Just beware the guys who are looking for celebrity. Just, I just, I would just stay away from them, to be completely, it doesn't mean they're automatically wrong, but just, you have so many options out there. We don't need to even deal with the ones that are kind of testy, you know what I mean? Why even go there? Um, so yeah, yes and no. Like, yes, we can absolutely see that. N no, not in all cases. And I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but it's a wonderful question. Yes? Hi. Um, well, this is a powerful mic. Um, <laughs> so I have a lot of family in the Worldwide Church of God, I'm assuming, because you spoke about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, one of which was is my dad. And... One thing, like, since then, just kind of, like, learning, because I was kind of taught, like, both doctrines, I guess, growing up. It was very, growing up, like, Christianity was a very interesting topic in my household. And how do you learn, like, discernment, like, coming out of that? Because, I mean, like, I get with the discernment for um, the Bible, like, read the Bible, like, and look into that. But, I mean, it's crazy how easily... Like, I think I've become, I've noticed that, like, I have been more of a target, like, especially in high school when it comes to things like that. And then just kind of, like, do you have any advice when it comes to kind of healing from that when it, like, am I crazy, am I not? Oh. Like, C crazy people don't ask the question, am I crazy? So, <laughs> you can, you can just, <laughs> you are not, okay? Um. But that being said, the content, and if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, the content you're looking for is ultimately, you as an individual need to be biblically literate enough that you even understand where the boundaries are. So if you're looking for that level of discernment, you can have it, it just takes time and you have to be immersed in the scriptures. One of the best podcasts out there right now is a colleague of mine, his name is Mike Winger. He does the Bible Thinker podcast. Um, so if you're looking for like, I'm a little overwhelmed and I don't know where to start, literally go Bible Thinker on YouTube and then pick whatever topic interests you and jump in. I guarantee there's no way that you will not be bitten by the apologetics bug. That's all he does is apologetics line by line. Bible study. So start there, and normally things will start making sense. So, but yeah, he, foundation first. Okay. Then we'll talk about building what needs to be built and what needs to be torn down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, and my, and my finger comes from a charismatic background. So he answers some of those questions from those of us who have been involved in the hyper-charismatic ministry mm -hmm. and have learned parts of mm -hmm. that of just feelings and not necessarily doctrine. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love Mike Winger too because he can he answers some of those and puts them in perspective. But it's all it's all it's all scriptural. What was it called again? Bible Thinker podcast. It's Mike Winker, Winger. You'll see it Bible Thinker. And then if you're interested in female apologists dealing with things that maybe girls talk about a little bit better sometimes than boys, um, women in apologetics is another one that will connect you with female apologists if that's something that's interesting to you. Go for it. Hey, Anna. Hi. Um, so, not, I understand, you probably understand what this is, but how would you define the hyper charismatic type movements, I guess, that are going on? And would you consider those a cult? I would define hyper charismatic. So, we say charismania. That's what we, that's what we say. Um, these are the guys that are ignoring 1 Corinthians protocol. Okay, these are the guys that are coming in and they're just 
it's a, it's just chaos. I don't know if you've ever been in those in those. Now, does that automatically make it a cult? Not necessarily. But what my question is in those cases when they're ignoring First Corinthians protocol, like they have, and for example, they have um, rampant. Let's just say they're they're speaking in tongues the entire time. You've got people running up and down the aisles but you don't have any interpretation of tongues. You don't have any type of sound doctrine ever being preached. It's just like, weren't they called back in the day, weren't they called woo-woo sessions? Does that sound familiar? I think that's what they were called. Um, where it's a, the church is supposed to gather together for corporate worship to receive information from the Lord and engage in the sacraments. That's the goal. What that looks like in application can be all across the board. But when you don't have that anymore, when the sheep aren't being fed, then my question to the leadership is, exactly what is going on here and how do you know that these are authentic Christian experiences? Like, how do you, how do you know this is the Holy Spirit? That's where I would start. So it can be very cultish, very fast. I can think of several groups that specifically focus on overwhelming in individuals and desensitizing them to the amount of chaos, and then they just never, they never experience anything else. Yeah. So, and the reason why the reason why I ask is I, I've served obviously in ministries that that have done exactly that, where people are running aisles, speaking in tongues continuously, mm -hmm. um, even to the point where some of these some of the part of the ministry it was so outlandish that people were actually the people that that were getting above and beyond were actually asked to to mellow down, right? So it, it's hyper charismatic yet. I don't know what you would call an ultra hyper charismatic, you know. Yeah, I don't know ultra either. Charismania. Yeah. So, but I mean, that to me, that now looking back at it, because we were completely blind to this stuff. Yeah. You know, but looking back at it, after getting some of that sound teaching, mm -hmm. you look at it and, and you don't. You like, how was I ever duped into something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it's just a testament, I think, of just how good and how slick and smooth a tongue that some people are. Yeah. So. You know, we just follow now. It's, it's, it's not about following a man. Right. It's about following the word first. Yeah. And then making sure that the man or the woman is going to match up with the word. Right. Well, and you have to remember, too, remember to contextualize your church experiences within the history of the church in your immediate in your immediate space. So the charismatic movement took off in the late 1960s, early 70s. This is like the Jesus culture stuff, mostly on the West Coast. Right. And then that, that was such a huge deal and that was, it was such a powerful thing that those scenarios, turning every church into a coffee house, for example, and having you know, no pews anymore and no hymns anymore and all that stuff, that was a movement. And it was a very powerful one for the purposes of the people who were into, that, into the, the anti-culture, right? This was to speak their language, which is what the church is supposed to do is go in and respond to the culture outside of it and speak the language of the people to bring them in. The problem is that we're now in 2022, right? We're, we, have, we have separated from that era enough that the next era is maybe not being fed the way that they need to because the guys who are still in control of the pulpit pulpit, whatever that means, um, the stage, you know, whatever it is, um, are still in the mindset of what was big and emphatic for them. And that's normal. And that doesn't mean they're trying to start a cult. It just means that they might not be as interested in keeping up with the needs of their congregation, which does happen. It does happen. Um, but it doesn't automatically mean that they're trying to start something damaging. Sometimes they're just, they've ha they haven't had oversight. And they haven't had somebody go in and be like, look, man, we got to do something about this feeding our sheep thing. Yeah. Hey. Hey. So, you know, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. Yes, I and do. People were asking questions about, like, Step how up would, to you, the how a little would bit you know? More. Yeah. How would you know? And, but I remember, like, I never knew anything else. So, but there was an innate feeling in me that always felt something was off even though my own parents were telling me this was right. Mm -hmm. So I think that you just have to listen to that inner spirit or whatever. That, that I don't inner, even know that inner that we were all designed by Yahweh yeah. and he talks to us, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> I just, 
I don't know. That was one thing. And then um, I great. remember, you know, my mom took four of us to church. Church. It wasn't called church. The Kingdom right. Hall. Right. For, you know, three times a week, out in service, all this stuff. And she did it like my dad never went. But um, she, they called my mom in to a meeting. All the elders did. And they were like, hey, your kids are out of control, which we were not. We were, like, really pretty good kids. They were like, you're a bad mom. You need help. We're going to come in and do all this, this, that, you know. And my mom takes being a mom pretty serious, and that really bummed her out. And, I mean, that was when my mom, like, I think just, like, decided this is too much. Uh Uh-huh. And it was like she started to question her faith. Yeah. And so we ended up moving, like, out of state, even though, like, all of her family, they are, they were all witnesses, and, like, you know, my mom was never formally disfellowship because right. we never went back, but, um, but a lot of them, like, wouldn't have anything to do with us, so I just wanted to say, like, as somebody who was in it, that my mom still, like, she comes to church with me, but she still has a lot of, like, guilt, and mm-hmm. a lot of, she still questions whether she's doing the right thing now Mm -hmm. or if she should still be doing that Mm -hmm. like I've seen her and she'll ask me questions and I'll be like oh mom you know I wish she would have been here tonight but um the other question I was going to ask and this is like probably for a whole different study but was how you felt about like the global world economic forum like that guy stuff yes yeah. That guy looks like a Bond villain. He does. Have you seen him? Yeah, he's scary. Yeah, I watched a speech. It was, I don't know enough about this at all. Okay. It was introduced to me in a in video form, and it was literally like, look at this, and that's it. That's okay. how I got introduced to it. Okay. Um, so I have to do a lot more research. Okay. But. Well, the reason I asked was because I actually had a lady that I knew, I've known her for years, and yeah. she asked if she could come and do like a thing in my classroom on um, recycling and sustainability. Okay. And I kind of had already been looking into the whole World Economic Forum and what their, you know, their goals are. And there's like, they have all these goals that are like by 2030, we have to have, like, we have to like come together. All these nations are like the United Nations are all coming together to to right. And the world headquarters is Bern, Switzerland, and every billionaire in the world is going to save the the planet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so. I just thought she was coming to talk about recycling, and, like, she didn't share that with me. And so she starts whipping out all these things about globalists and showing this video from Malala. And I was like, whoa, hold the front, you know. Yeah. And so I had to, like, sit with my kids and be like, hey, that was one person's, like, I mean, I'm talking to eight-year-olds, like, they're, like, 100, you know. I'm like, listen, that's one person's ideas about things but you know and that's what you have to do yeah I'm like you know who we all know who takes good care of everything we don't have to Uh worry about 2030 do we and they're like no and then they're all like Jesus and I'm like you said it yeah (laughs) you have to yeah sometimes because people will get really caught up they get the the conspiracy nut Thing happens yeah, but with it was a lot like, of this stuff. Well, Not that goodness, it's the bad thing, but I don't want yeah. like all these little eight-year-olds to think that by 2030 they have to do something, right. you know. And I'm like, I don't know enough about it to. But I'm like, okay, it's just one person's ideas. That was perfect. Okay, <laughs> you're good. I, I don't. I don't know how much more else I can do. That was perfect. It is 9:04 p.m. I want to honor y'all's time, especially you who have to drive back because a bunch of you came here from way far away. Thank you for coming out. I am blown away that this many people wanted to do this topic. I will be updating, and hopefully if we're, if we're welcome back, then we'll have a normal semester next semester, and otherwise you know where to find me. Alrighty, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, drive safely.